Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today, I'm with a very special guest, the one and only Elon Wright. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> so from my understanding, you started out in like orchestra and jazz band, right? Yeah, yeah. When I first started playing music, it was an orchestra. I was in fourth grade, um, and I did that for about 12 years. Um, so, you know, throughout high school and um, middle school, you know, I was in a bunch of bands and stuff as well, just uh, playing electric instruments. But I got a lot of years in in the orchestra. Yeah, I, I always say the best artists either come from like the church or some type of band or orchestra program. Yeah, well, you know, luckily, you know, growing up in Shoreline, I had a pretty good music program. Um, so it was always accessible. I was nice for sure i have a funny story i um i was in band from sixth grade till 12th grade so like around six to seven years and um i had a really good band program i grew up on mercer island and the mercer island band program like was always touring like australia like the when i was a senior we went to the rose bowl and um sir mix a lot like was actually part of our show for the rose bowl it was pretty cool wow that's amazing um, But I would always, like, talk too much in class or make, like, squeaks on purpose or something. Like, I was a good – I was a clarinetist. I was a good clarinetist, but, like, I didn't like band because it was too serious for me. So, like, yeah, all the kids would get annoyed because I'd always, like, do really good on, like, these, like, tests and stuff, like, playing Mm -hmm. tests. But I'd always just mess around in band class. So, the summer – Yeah, I I was (laughs) definitely the same. You know, my my orchestra teacher didn't like dealing with me, but – I was I was good um, at playing in, the instrument, but I would sit in the back. I played this the upright bass, you know. Oh, I would yeah. sit back there and just like make little songs. I was trying to be quiet, but I was obviously a distraction. So, right. <laughs> and um, so when I graduated high school, though, because I was so done with band, like I enjoyed the experiences. Like if I wasn't in band, I definitely wouldn't have gotten the experiences I gotten. But like the summer I graduated band, I literally like burned my clarinet like in a wow. bonfire the case and everything <laughs> you were over it you said i'm i'm done with the clarinet yeah i was i was just breaking my ties from yeah band. i don't think i've ever lit an instrument on fire i'm trying to think i know i thought about it for a, mi- a music video um but i don't think i've ever actually lit anything on fire I know a lot of people like try to like break guitars and stuff, but that's pretty yeah. common. Yeah. It was probably it was probably not healthy that I burnt the clarinet though. It was a it was a plastic clarinet, so I wasn't really worried about it, but like the smoke was completely oh, yeah. just black. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so from my understanding, you're actually a teacher at the residency now? Yeah, I started doing that a couple of years ago. Um, so I was just teaching production and then uh, so I did the in-person, you know, cohort last year, 2019, uh, for the first time. And it was, it was an awesome experience. You know, the years leading up to it, I was working with them just at, like out of the studio and um, recording a lot of the young artists. Um, they were, you know, booking time out at the space. And I just got to know a lot of the people through the program and um, got to know all the other teachers. And it's just a it's a really cool program and it's something that um, I, I feel strongly about is just education in general, just um, continuing to offer opportunities uh, for people to be excited about making and playing music and performing. Um, and so, yeah, I was happy to be offered uh, the opportunity and I loved it last year. And then this year, obviously, it's been a little different, um, but we've been doing a lot of online coursework and then we did a virtual week long um, course this this summer, uh, which was really fun. And then, yeah, just continuing to work with the young artists, get recording time for them. Um, actually started uh, doing an internship opportunity through the residency uh, at the studio as well for, for the people that are part of the residency that are a little more ex- uh, interested in kind of the technical engineering side of it all. Um, so that's been really fun too. So yeah, I love the program and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. Break it down a little bit more for um, fans who might not even be from Seattle, like what the residency is. So the residency is a, it's kind of a couple things. Um, it, it's a big community. It's a big family, but but what it really um, 
tries to teach is kind of social justice through um, hip hop, through youth development. And it's an opportunity for young artists, uh, usually, you know, from ages 16 to 19, um, to just join the community and just um, meet some people, perform, learn a little bit about the music industry. Um, but all of that kind of is centered around a, a greater conversation about um, just like community in, in the world and um, how to kind of navigate the space that we're in. And so um, it's, it's a really cool program. And, and I personally coming from a more like musical production based um, background have learned a lot just through the conversations, just through the, um, the various aspects of the program. And that's one thing that <clears throat> was really great about the first year um, when we were all in person, you know, that sense of community that's so strong and so um, valuable, I think, was, was great. And this year has been a little harder to, to feel that, that type of connection just because of the physical limitations um, mm -hmm. from, from COVID. But uh, we're trying our best to continue to instill that community. There's weekly get togethers, you know, on Zoom and um, ways for people to connect and stay connected and really just build out kind of the family that's the residency that's what i what i think of it now is just like kind of a big growing family so for sure i'm close with them one of the artists i know a few artists from there but um like yesterday even i went on a hike with nestra and um yeah he's great yeah and from my understanding he said that you guys actually like moved the age limit to like 24 or something or is that yeah this year we extended it out to 24 uh it was 19 was the age limit and now it's um it's 24, so it was nice to see kind of a few people come back who had already done the program. You know, a lot of people, when they do the program for one year, they, they want to come back. They want to continue to be a part of it. And so, yeah, we had, you know, it's cool to see some people come back and also just um, open up the, the community a little bit more. So, yeah, yeah, moved it up to 24. Do you think it's, um, you guys do a lot of promotion towards the residency or do you think it's kind of more of like, if you know what it is, you know what it is like an exclusive type deal. Cause it's, no, it's definitely important too, though. There's definitely promotion, you know, it's, um, it's definitely uh, been in kind of conjunction with uh, arts core for the last many years. Um, and then recently uh, was just titled their or given their own uh, kind of nonprofit title. And so, I would definitely say that it's it's out there and it's um, it's something that's you know we're we're hoping to grow and continue growing. It's been active for five years now. Um, this is actually the sixth year, but um, we're hoping to grow and and hopefully you know branch out not just from Seattle but be a, a community space throughout uh, different parts of the region and even the country. Mm -hmm. So did was is Malcolm Moore the one that founded it, or is he more just like kind of the face of the program? He's one of the founders. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So do you think, is, do you think enough artists do that when they like make a name for themselves, come back to Seattle, make a program like this? Or this, is this kind of like out of this world that he kind of took these steps to do something like this? I think it's really cool that um, the program was started, was created, you know. Um, I definitely have a lot of admiration for Ben for choosing to, you know, use his platform and his kind of, um, his place in the world to just kind of create like a, like I said, a community, a hip hop based community too, because that's something that, you know, both him and I growing up in Seattle, that wasn't very much of, of that going on when we were in high school, you know, uh, that type of community. So I think it's really cool that it's been offered, um, you know, in terms of whether or not people should be using their platform to do that, like, yeah, I think it's great anytime an artist does, you know, and you see it in different in different ways um, with different artists. You know, I think I just saw what Travis Scott just released or just announced some new fundraiser or uh, campaign that he's launching. Anyways, yeah, it's it's great to see to see those types of things happen. I think more of that in the world is is always a good thing. Yeah, for sure. When I'm talking to a lot of artists, though, it seems like there's a thing where artists leave Seattle and they don't tend to come back, or if they do, mm. they don't really rep Seattle. Why do you think that happens? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of a city that is um, 
you know, if you want to compare Seattle to, you know, an LA or a New York, you know, the, the industry lives in those spaces and those, in those towns and has for, you know, a, a long, long time. And so I think if you want to create a city that, you know, has all the resources, then people that are talented from the city should, should be kind of, you know, staying within the city. But there's a catch to that because if you are really talented and you are deserving of kind of a wider audience or you feel that you have what it takes, then you really want to put yourself in the center of, the, of where the business lives. And that's not in Seattle. That's in LA or New York or Nashville, you know? And mm -hmm. so um, I understand why people leave to pursue opportunities that exist in other in other cities but I also believe that as Seattle grows um, there will be less of a need for that and I think you know you've seen like nowadays there's a lot more people who are succeeding throughout Seattle um, at a high level that are really achieving some some impressive um, feats and, and maintain you know creating their own fan bases, these massive fan bases and touring and uh, selling, you know, charting and selling tons and tons of records. You're getting millions and millions of streams. That's becoming more and more common with, with artists in Seattle, I think. And so that's great to see. Um, yeah, you know, I, I know a lot of people that have moved to LA and have been successful and have done great things. And then I know a lot of people that have moved to LA and they're just kind of in LA now. And that's fine. You know, it's... Um, I just love Seattle. I want to see the, the industry grow here. And so that's where I'm at. <laughs> sure. So you were, you were, do you feel that you were able to like make your name in Seattle? I know you kind of have like a unique story of getting signed pretty young with a band. Mm. But so you did like touring, but did that mean you're, when people thought of your band, they thought of Seattle and you're able to make your name here in Seattle? Or is the touring and going out to a different audience? What really helped? Honestly, yeah, I would say that in terms of the band, you know, back in the early 2000s, like, yeah, touring was the move. And I think we were more popular in other parts of the country than we were in Seattle. Uh, we, we were selling out shows, you know, at Redmond Firehouse and um, K-Tub, the Kirkland Teen Center, yeah. you know, places <laughs> that shows were, were happening at that time. And that was great. Um, but really touring for us is where we where we realized there was a fan base that was that was out there that was that was big and um i think we did bumper shoot in 2007 um yeah i don't know i just i guess i don't i don't think about you know the band as like a local success you know like a mm. i think that our success was in in the national scale um and so yeah you know, when I, when I think of those days and when I think of touring and stuff like that and being, you know, with Atlantic and, and doing, it was, you know, about five years of continuous touring. Um, that was the, that was the move at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't even an option to stay home. Like we couldn't, there wasn't um, any sort of streaming industry or anything like that, that would give you any source of revenue. You had to play your shows and sell your merch. Yeah. go on tour so that's what we did so with this pandemic it realistically doesn't seem like it's going anywhere anytime soon do you think this yeah. is going to do you think this is going to create like a new type of artist that doesn't understand how to do live events ever if they're just maybe they just graduated last year and the first I, mean, I think that i think that's even the case before the pandemic you know there are a lot of artists that are able to be successful you know through the internet through streaming um, by creating creative content, um, video content or graphic content along with their music and, and create these really successful, massive careers um, and never touch a stage. Mm. Um, but I think that it's super important that, you know, as an artist, you have a, a good live performance and you're able to perform your music. I think that's, that's super important crucial but I don't think it's as necessary now as it was you know in the past so definitely um I don't know if the pandemic will cause that <laughs> you know I think it's already happening but or it's already been happening but um I hope that young artists continue to appreciate the value of live performance and 
will continue to do it. You know, sure. I think, I think they will. I think there's no real replacing that type of energy or just that, that transfer of energy um, between an artist and a fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just got it like live is just so special. Yeah. I think the, the best artists know how to like reinvent themselves in times like these though, for sure. Yeah. And you're also seeing some really creative ways to interact and create engagement with fans. You know, people are, obviously limited in what they can do and i've seen a lot of close friends you know suffer through tours being canceled and shows being lost and you know that sucks like there's, there's such a big part of so many people's livelihoods but you're also seeing this kind of um new perspective on okay how do i continue engaging how do i create engagement with my fans how do i stand out or do something that will um take my music further than it than it can go you know by myself um so it's cool cool to see but i love yeah. shows yeah who doesn't that was like one of the best ways to connect with people before like the i like i who would have thought that we just wouldn't be able to do shows? <laughs> Never in my life did I think that. And it really take you take. I I played a lot of shows and I've I've been to a ton of shows in my life and I still feel like I took it for granted when it was there. Damn. Now that it's not there, it's like, man, I'm you know all those shows i decided to stay home instead of go out like I, I wish I had taken that opportunity. But I also think that when things do chill out and you know things kind of open up again i i really do think there's going to be a ton of activity in the live scene like once it once it gets back on its feet because everybody misses it you know like i, I think mm -hmm. we have we have a year's worth of shows to make up for so I, I think that the the next time concerts can happen i think they will be very popping Hopefully the venues will all be around still, you know, like that's yeah. definitely a worry too. No, I know. And it's, you know, you're seeing, seeing it happen uh, all over the country and, and also here and it sucks every single time. You know, there's a, a place called Chain Reaction down in LA that, or LA or San Diego, um, but um, I think it's LA. They're closing down because of the pandemic, and it's such a classic spot for so many touring acts, and so many people like got their uh, you know leg in the door playing at venues like that, and you see it happen across the country. It's just like it sucks. It's the biggest bummer. So yeah, I hope that they I hope that venues pull through. I was super sad to see about the crocodile closing down. I'm happy they're relocating and like actually growing into a new space, but. Um, there's so many memories attached to that space. Um, being young and going to shows for the first time and seeing some of my favorite acts to, to getting to perform on that stage um, a few times, just like, it's, it's so hard to replace that type of um, space in a city, especially a city like Seattle that's growing and changing so rapidly. You know, when, when a place like that gets lost, you're like, damn. Very intimate but, place. It was, mm -hmm. that was honestly probably one of my favorite venues. Like you couldn't, yeah. it was very small, but like, I think that's what made it so nice. Yeah. But I saw some crazy acts on that stage and it was tight. It's intimate. You know, it's that, I love those like 500 to thousand person venues. You know, my favorite venue is the show box. Um, Which one? Know, the market. Hands oh, down. That's yeah. my favorite venue of all time. Cause it's that perfect. Like to me, it's, just big enough to where you can have like these great crazy performances but it still feels small um or it still feels intimate i should say and so yeah the last concert i got to see before everything shut down was michael kiwanuka in at the show box at the market and it was a phenomenal show so i'm, I'm thankful for that <laughs> I yeah I, that show. I think i literally went to like one of the last shows too i went Maybe there might have been another one after, but I went. My last show was like March eighth or something. Wow! I am. Um, I interviewed Marky Basie, and um, after his concert in like the yeah. one of the back rooms at the at the showbox, nice. which is such a great venue too, because it's like it's so cool. Like the bar like wraps around the. Mm -hmm. It's just so cool. Yeah, and that you know when they're talking about tearing that place down. It's just so hard to think about, even if that, if the show box as a venue goes to a different space, that room and the like energy in that space is, is so special. 
Yeah. So I hope it never happens. So when the band ended and you started to become more of this producer guy and artist, do you feel like you had to like reinvent yourself from like the ground up or were you able to keep that momentum from the band and then starting more off as a producer? I think, so I was getting into production when I was on tour, you know, I had a laptop and I was kind of experimenting um, with making my own beats and, you know, I had been rapping and, and stuff when I was in high school and I was doing that kind of for fun um, in on the long drives, you know, it was a good way for me to kind of pass the time and learn something. So I was making beats on reason. And so when I came back from touring, um, I just, I just turned 21 and um, I was just, you know, moving out of my parents and, and into my own place for the first time. And I had a ton of opportunity to just continue producing. Like I, I realized when I got home that like one of the things I loved most about being part of music in general was like that creative process of making the songs um, come to life from just like an idea in your head to something that's like a finished product. And I got really into recording and how you know you can capture sound and make it sound really good and really professional and like I, that just became something I, I i loved to dive into and for the beginning it was for my own music but over time i think because of my musical community um i was able to kind of do that for other people you know i think one of the benefits of being in the band that helped me out was that i did create you know a lot of friends and friendships with other artists and other musicians and so i was always like hey let me let me record your music let me like you know, let's make something together um and that gave me a lot of experience and just working with other artists working with people um and that type of experience is like which you don't get at um at a school or something, you know, you just kind of, those, those interactions um, were what kind of helped shape, shape me as a, as a producer and as a, as a recording engineer. So. Mm -hmm. um, so you never, you never right. really lost faith then because you were still part of the community no matter what, right? Yeah. I mean, I've always been kind of, you know, <laughs> um, it's rare, you know, I've been making money playing music since I was 17 um, and I've been self-employed you know through the studio for the last like six years um, wow. but uh, you know that's something that um, I I'm super appreciative for I, I'm thankful it took a lot of years of just like struggling and and yeah the faith that I had and this is going to work out I guess I do have quite a bit of that <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know it was more like I, I love doing this I want to figure out how to make this happen and being fortunate enough to be in a community with amazingly talented people that um, you know we we shared similar visions and we we worked towards it I do think that um, a lot of my success is the result of a, a group of people you know it takes a village and, and there's definitely been a village of people involved in in getting along to where we are now so um yeah i've always had this <laughs> kind of inherent optimism that yeah. i'm gonna figure this out i'm gonna make it work um and and fortunately you know i've been well supported you know, i i've got a amazing wife that doesn't think i'm crazy mm -hmm. for doing this type of stuff um and i've got a great family and i've got great friends who are also amazingly talented artists um so i do feel fortunate for that yeah, that's actually very important, whether it's like friends or significant others that really understand what you're doing and believe in it. Because sometimes like, especially for an up and coming artist, like friends or like family, honestly, you sometimes don't understand what you're even talking about. You want to be an artist? What? Where's yeah. the money in that? I mean, it's a valid question too, you know? And so, uh, yeah, that can really kind of keep you from making that full that full leap into whatever it is you're passionate about um and a lot of people there's there is insecurity in it you know um i still have to you know being self-employed also means you have to be self-driven to do the things that are going to get you you know get your ends met 
<laughs> um, and some people just don't have that. Some people would rather have a manager tell them you work these hours, these days of the week, and, and they don't have to think about that. But like, um, you know, you have, yeah, you just have to have a certain mindset in, in what you're setting out to accomplish, I think, um, that will allow you to be successful. You know, I tried to do the studio full time in the past and I failed, you know, I had to get a job because I wasn't making any money. Um, and I had to kind of reassess, okay, well, well, why did that not work this time? And it was, you know, it was a few things, but ultimately when I was ready to leap back into the world, um, of just like, you know, the studio and production doing that full time. Um, I had a different kind of game plan, a different way I was going to do that. And it's been working. So that's good. Yeah. What is some advice they can give people that want to start up like a studio? Cause like to make a well-known studio, like your, your guys is, is like incredible. Like, well, the first thing when I, the first thing, thank people you, say, man. I appreciate it. The first thing people say when I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm about to talk to Elon. They're like Ruby room. Yeah. <laughs> first thing they say again you know uh, a common theme something that i just believe strongly in is community and we've been fortunate again to to have such um a wide number of artists from seattle you know it really um we've been able to work with hundreds of people in the city and when you walk in to the room and you see you know pictures of people that you know people that you like as artists or people that you like aspire to work with or something you see that they're in this space too it just creates a, a better like sense of connection um and it makes you feel like you're part of a community again and and mm -hmm. I, I would say that my advice um to answer your question would be to build that community and to be you know i think that there's two things you have to juggle as a recording studio because you're trying to hopefully have some sort of sustainable business that allows you to, um, you know, pay your rent, um, pay your bills. But at the same time, it's such a, it's a creative space. It's a place where people want to feel welcome to be their creative selves, to be vulnerable, to be emotional, to be wacky or whatever they want to do to feel creative and to feel like they're in that zone. So you're really trying to create just this kind of comfort level. Um, and um, when you have that and you can tie it with the, the business side of it, then it just, um, it, it works well. And I think that for us, you know, we had Nima and I, you know, when we started the studio, we were working with Saul uh, as his band and producers. Um, and through that connection and through a few other connections, we knew other artists in the city and we were able to just continuously work with a bunch of people who, you know, were, were serious about their careers and their music. And um, we just tried to be consistent with it and, and try to keep um, putting out music and elevating and progressing all of our careers. Um, and there's been a few artists that we've been, you know, since the kind of jump with that have done really great things with their careers. And um, that obviously gives you like some level of credibility, but then, you know, you want anybody that walks into the space to feel like they're welcome and that their uh, ideas are valid and that we're just here to make the best music we can. And so um, we try to make the environment feel that way and then still create good music, you know? Um, it's kind of long-winded, but <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know, um, the community is the important part. You know, we're like playing basketball on the back with people. People can pull up, and it's been hard because we just moved into a new space, um, and it's amazing. It's beautiful, and we've just been limited with what we can do because of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of like goals for how we're going to utilize the new space that are that's centered around the community and just continuing to build the community um and so hopefully you know hopefully things people wear their masks out there so that you know we can get back to hosting cool events and stuff soon but um yeah that that community building that within you know within your circle starting within your circle but but hopefully focusing um on creating relationships of like-minded people like people that also want to succeed and take their you know craft to the highest level possible you know 
and you have a video team and you have a graphic team photographers and you have all these people that are hungry in the city that want to prove that they're, you know, really dope. And you get those people together and you start making content together as a community. And then you all can succeed and grow from that. Um, sure. I think that's something that we were lucky uh, to do with a lot of dope artists. So hell yeah. So where'd you guys move to and from? Like from my understanding, you guys were like in North Seattle at first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were in North Seattle for the last seven years. Um, and we moved into Georgetown in May oh, wow. of this year. And so it's been all kind of quarantine season for us. But um, yeah, it's a great space. Um, it was hard to move from a place that, you know, we were attached to, but it was also time for us to kind of grow and um, push ourselves forward. Um, sometimes you get comfortable in yeah. a space and you wanna, you wanna live there forever, but we also have big goals and, and ideas of how we wanna take things to the next level. So, so we took the plunge into the next chapter. Um, but yeah, it's a lot more space and um, then just like investing in new gear and just get, trying to get better at, at what we do you know, try to make better products. So do you guys have like crazy, like COVID regulations? Cause I bet there's tons of artists who still want to like record during this. Yeah. Of... I mean, we aren't, um, irresponsible, you know, mm. we have limited sessions, uh, limited attendance, people wear masks. We've got hand sanitizer everywhere. We wipe down the booth. We got, you know, the Clorox wipes We're we're wiping down between sessions um, and between artists in the booth. Uh, we had a thermometer for a while, but um, I don't think it's there anymore. <laughs> but then this last couple of weeks, you know, they, they kind of shut things down again. Yeah. And we've just been cautious, you know, both Nima and I have young, young kids at home. And so we're not trying to bring anything home. We're trying to be smart for our families. And, uh, but at the same time, you're right, you know, there are tons of people out here trying to make music. And so, yeah, we're, we're doing some sessions, um, but trying to do it smartly. And I've been doing a lot of just mixing sessions. So just by myself. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we're working. You mm -hmm. know, um, I did a bunch of recording sessions with the residency artists um, and those were great. And then after the last, you know, announcements a couple weeks ago, we, kind of put that on pause mm -hmm. so now i've just been kind of there mixing by myself um more or less so 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 when people are coming to the ruby room is it just you and nima as like the main producers or do you guys have like hired other producers as well that come in or yeah so that? nima nima and i um own you know own the business and also we do production together and individually. And then we also do, you know, mixing and engineering work. Um, we have three other engineers working with us right now. Um, P White is also a producer, um, but he does production and engineering out of the space. Uh, Seth McDonald, who is a member of All Star Opera, is kind of like a wearer of many hats, I think is what he would say. He works out of the space as well. And then we recently added um, Talea to um, the mix. She's an engineer um, and a vocalist, very talented um, artist that I've known now for a few years, um, who's shown just a real passion in, in engineering and, and getting into that world. And uh, it's really, really been cool to watch. Uh, she's, she's grown a lot and yeah, we're excited. So um, we have, the five of us right now, um, Nima and I, like I said, both have newborn children. So we're in like the first year of, of daddy duty. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And so we're, we're around a little less we have been. Um, and so it's been nice to have other engineers around and just trying to keep the, keep the space active. So, For sure. Yeah. Are there artists that only solely like work with you guys or do most artists like around the Seattle go to your studio and then maybe other people's studios as well? Um, I think it, it's a mix. I know, you know, I've, I've been working with some artists um, for like 12 years now. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we've, we've had a long relationship together and uh, I think that I will be someone they always reach out to for work, but I'm not like, um, hoarding people or saying you have you can only work with me like if you need to go and, and track some vocals or whatever somewhere else go go for it 
you know mm -hmm. um there's some great studios in the city and um there's pl plenty of places to work out of i don't think that um I think there are certain artists that like to work with us for our creative process. And so they choose to work with us. Um, but again, if like an opportunity pops up in another space and they want to go over there, then they do that, you know? Um, yeah, I'd say that's. How do, how do artists like get in contact with you? Like, is it, fair, do you have like a need to know type basis? Like if you know someone and that's how you get into the Ruby room or how does that work? Uh, we have a website. Um, rubyroomrecordings.com there's an inquiry that's just like an email you can that sends out to us um and we we can get contacted that way you can email us directly you can dm us um we haven't done like a whole we've never done a whole lot of promo mm. around our studio uh it's been a lot of word of mouth um between artists hey like i, I work with these guys at this space and that's gotten us a lot of really great clients um and I'd say now it's becoming more, um, there's like more and more studios in the city and there's um, an increasing need to have like a social media presence and be kind of, you know, out there in, in like a marketing tip, which is newer to us. And, you know, I think it's a fun new, you know, it's, it's just like the way of the future, everybody just getting hip with technology. Um, and I feel kind of like a curmudgeon in that sense but <laughs> i'm trying to hang you know <laughs> hang with the kids but no um yeah yeah we have an instagram we have a website um people can contact us that way mm -hmm. i bet you guys like are always on top of the new gear though like yes yeah, maybe social media is kind of maybe lacking i have no idea but like i bet you guys are like oh yeah that's the new newest thing that just came out whether it's a guitar or mpc oh yeah or i mean we're we're always grazing around the magazines and checking out the gear and I've been um kind of going on like a synth tip for a little while buying some analog synths and mm -hmm. yeah we've just been getting some new gear new toys new things to play with it's always fun and it's also like an, a losing battle you know you kind of gotta at some point you gotta pick okay th this is my stuff um and this I'm gonna learn how to use this really well um because you can buy new gear every six months yeah and just like always have new gear but it's also fun to just like swap out units and try things and figure out what works but hopefully when you find something that works really well for you you know you, you hang on to it get for your sure. get your process lined up but um yeah i mean you know the magazines they they all look so beautiful i want yes. everything <laughs> um but you don't need everything you know it's mm -hmm. like you've heard it from tons of different people but it's not really about the gear as much as it is, is about the, heart. the ear the heart yeah, the <laughs> ears you know like it, if you can make it sound good regardless of what you're using um that's the goal that's the mission mm -hmm. um and so i don't think there's like a need but then at the same time there are definitely units and pieces of equipment out there that make certain things easier or make it more efficient to get to a certain place. And so those are the things I'm interested in. It's like, how do, I, sure. <laughs> how do I incorporate things that make what I do a little easier from the jump? Just make it a little less of a um, seeking out, trying to find something. It's just like kind of there. That's what I'm thinking about these days. So sound wise, what do you think makes you guys stand out compared to other producers throughout the Seattle area or even just the world in general? Mm. Um, I think, you know, Nima and I both come from band backgrounds, you know, um, he was drummer in a band, I was playing guitar and bass in bands. Um, and so we've always kind of created our ideas through jamming, through like being together, each with an instrument, kind of playing out our ideas. And I, and I think that interaction has benefited us in our production um, for a long time. It was just like, idea building in that environment was more cohesive for us and we have a little more interaction between instruments and i think that that that's been a huge um kind of advantage for us i don't know if it's an advantage but it's one of the things that has worked well for us um and i think that aside from that it's just we're we're constantly push, pushing ourselves to 
sound as good as we can, you know, um, focusing on things like sound selection, really good recording techniques, like trying to make sure that we're, we're doing the right steps in the beginning um, of the process so that we're not fighting things later on down the road. We're trying to correct things after the fact, you know. So I think we're getting a little more particular with with capturing and recording um, and, and just being super mindful of hat, like the sound selection, the, the tone of everything. Those, those types, that attention, I think is what's gonna help separate anybody um, from, other, from other artists is just that, that super focus on, on quality sounds, quality compositions. Cause you know, like really good music can be four things. Um, yeah. If they're four great things. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, I think a lot of young producers, and I'm guilty of this as well, is like, if it doesn't sound right, I need to slap another layer on it, or I need to add another instrument, or I need to do something, you know, um, when maybe the problem itself was the sound you started with just wasn't, wasn't it. Right. So trying to just kind of grip, grip that reality and, you know, <laughs> be a little more um, of a stickler in that phase of, of production, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're also like a recording artist. What do you prefer more to do, be the producer or the recording okay. artist? Um, I definitely prefer production. I think that I would hardly consider myself a recording artist. Um, but I do find my way singing on people's songs sometimes. I'm a recording musician. Um, so playing bass and guitar on recordings. I like... I like just being the artist in, on days because it's like only a part of my brain that I'm trying to use. I'm just mm -hmm. like, okay, play my, play my instrument, play it well. And I actually don't feel like I play as much music as I would like to in my life. Um, Cause that's what I, I did so, so much of that for a long time. And now in the production role, it's like, okay, I pick up my guitar, play something, set it down and like carry on. And I, I like the days when I can just be a guitarist for a whole day. Like yeah. that's that's dope but i think that my like passion the thing that i love the most about the music in you know world is being in the role of the producer um, mm -hmm. and kind of putting all the people in the room together to make the thing that is in your head that you could never do by yourself um that to me is like the most exciting part of it all so I think I would choose that, but I love being a guitarist and being a bassist. Singing, <laughs> I, I have a lot of ideas when it comes to singing and I did background singing, you know, I was a backup vocalist for a long time. So I understand harmony. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like that when I'm working with, with vocalists, cause we can kind of riff off, figure out harmonies and stuff together. And like, I'll sing at you, but I don't think I have a good voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sometimes like I, I'll reference, I'll sing like a reference demo and it'll just be become the hook of the song and I'm like oh, okay cool mm -hmm. <laughs> I never really imagined it's going to be me and I've always dreamt of like making my own project I'd love to do that but when it comes to like prioritizing the, the jobs I have in front of me it's like um, I like the production stuff is at the top the engineering stuff is at the top mm -hmm. um, sometime sometime in my life I'll make a project you know, of my more on the back burner, I guess, compared to, yeah, it's just not as important. You know, I, I also just think that I love collaborating with other artists. I love like, you know, sharing ideas. And, um, I think I make better music when I work with other people. So <laughs> it's like, why would I want to make a solo project? You know, if right. I can make something better with, with other people and have a fun time doing it. So after all these years, what keeps you so passionate about this? I don't know, man. No, um, uh, honestly, I just love music, man. It's just like to me, it's the it's it's such a unique blend. Like the the role that I'm in specifically, there's such a, a kind of um, juxtaposition of this like technical side, but also just like the creativity and like the capturing of this super intimate type of art um, is just fascinating to me and like every day I can walk into the studio and make some different thing and it can be you know a different style different genre um different moods every single day is just different and um 
I'm just curious enough about music in general to like want to experience it as much as I can. And so it's just exciting, you know, um, when I think about when I have time to myself, like all I want to do is either play an instrument or record something or like even mix something and like try to make it sound as good as I can. Like that's the most exciting kind of thing I can think about um, personally. So I don't know. It's just always been that way. I, I love, I love playing music. I love making music. I love listening to it. And um, you know, I don't see my, I can't see myself doing something different. So I just have to figure out how to do it <laughs> for like a living because <laughs> otherwise I don't know what I'll do, but um, yeah, I don't, you know, um, I've always, I've kind of said it a few times in the past that I think of making music as like kind of like a video game or like a game of some sort. It's like a puzzle really um, where you're trying to put these these different pieces together, you know, knowing that, you know, our, all kind of Western music is rooted in these 12 notes and you have a, kind of a endless um, access to instruments these days, right? Any sort of instrument you can imagine, but you have these notes and um, the confines of like rhythm and, and things like that. And, and yet we can make so many millions of different things out of it. It's like crazy, you know, <laughs> it, just, oh, yeah. it just makes me, I can trip. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's just how I feel. Yeah, you sound like the perfect teacher for the residency. <laughs> be passionate, you know. <laughs> that's true. I mean, yeah, I love, I love what I do. I'm, I'm super thankful for it. Um, I don't think you could do this type of work without having that type of passion. Because why, you know, <laughs> why else would you? You know, it's not like being an engineer. Um, isn't like always the most glamorous thing. In fact, I think it's it's far from the most glamorous thing in the world, but I love doing it, so. Very important. I feel like you're probably gonna, you and Neem are gonna make your kids like little Einsteins and music probably. <laughs> <laughs> My kid loves the piano. He plays on it for hours every day, um, like smashing it, you know, <laughs> not really playing it. But, but like if it's in the room, he's going towards it. He's interested in it. Um, I don't wanna like, force my kid to like anything you know i, I want to kind of support whatever it is that he likes but it's nice to see, like it's it's cool to see the interest because i'm like oh maybe I, maybe he'll think i'm cooler when he's older because i can play the piano too um but you know i i love seeing him play but you know he's one years old so <laughs> he's got some time hell yeah <laughs> So, Elon, what is some advice that you have for up-and-coming artists, creators, influencers? Man, just go hard. Just, like, find the thing that makes you super excited and just just go for it. Um, I know that's, like, kind of cliche, but I really – I do believe um, that if you find something that you can wake up excited about every single day, that that is the thing you should – you should pursue in your life. Um, that would be one piece of advice. And then my other advice, which I've, I've referenced a few times is build that community, you know, um, that's going to help you grow as an individual, you know, find those people in your circle that are, have similar goals, want to do the same kind of um, progression as you and, and build together you know, especially with producers, a lot of people are looking to get those placements and, you know, get on the big, big name records, you know, off the jump and really just build that community with the artists, grow together, come up together. There's no better feeling than doing that and, and having a community will just elevate you. So um, I would say that, you know, find your passion and then find your people <laughs> and, yeah. and go from there. So exactly. Well, this is the NAS podcast with Elon Wright. Thanks for oh, yeah. having me. Yeah, there you go.